Je vais peut-être euh, d'abord passer la, la parole à, à Hervé, Hervé Drévillon, pour vous poser quelques questions, et ensuite à, à Bruno Tré, et puis euh, si dans la salle, une ou deux questions euh, se veulent être posées, on les prendra par, euh, par la suite. Hervé, je te passe la parole. Merci Louis. Euh, merci euh, Sœur de nous avoir expliqué que finalement que Churchill s'était comporté comme un chimpanzé en développant une stratégie qui consistait à chercher des alliés. Euh, je voudrais euh, vous interroger sur euh, la période des origines que vous avez évoquées, l'âge classique de la stratégie et en particulier euh, ce moment de la naissance du mot stratégie qui apparaît en effet en France euh, en 1771, sous la plume de Joline Mézoroy. Et vous avez euh, rattaché cette euh, apparition du mot stratégie et le succès qu'il rencontre chez les auteurs euh, de l'époque euh, au courant des Lumières, à la philosophie des Lumières et euh, à cette idée finalement que chaque activité humaine devait euh, se soumettre à l'examen de, euh, de la raison. Il se trouve aussi que c'est le moment où se pose la question de, du sujet de la stratégie, de savoir qui est l'auteur de cette rationalité. Nous sommes ici dans l'amphithéâtre Richelieu, et Richelieu pensait que l'auteur de la guerre, l'acteur de la guerre, c'est l'État, et que donc la rationalité qui s'appliquait dans la guerre était la raison d'État. Dans les années 1770-1780, c'est la nation qui apparaît, et précisément, la stratégie est aussi une façon de, le concept de stratégie, une façon de penser la relation entre la nation et la guerre. Euh, D'où ma question. Il est question aujourd'hui, et Louis le rappelait dans sa présentation, d'une crise de la stratégie, d'une crise de la pensée stratégique. En Angleterre actuellement, il existe un débat... Euh, puisqu'il euh, se dit que euh, euh, le gouvernement anglais et le gouvernement américain ont singulièrement manqué de vision stratégique. Et donc, est-ce que cette crise de la stratégie ne serait pas imputable à une crise du sujet Autrement dit, jusqu'à quel point l'idée de stratégie est-elle dépendante de l'État et de la nation Thank you. Um, yes, there is a, indeed a, a discussion going on. Uh, one of my colleagues, Professor Hugh Strawn at University of Oxford, uh, uh, has been very uh, vitriolic about uh, the lack of strategic vision. I think, he's a, I think there's a mistake here, um, and it follows from my lecture, in believing that strategy is a magic ingredient that if only you have... You, all the policy dilemmas that you face will be sorted out and turned into some sort of coherent system. The reason that we have difficulty is because we're trying to achieve a number of different things at the same time in very complex situations. Um, it's actually quite striking when you see the similar complaints made by Robert Gates about Obama but he ends up saying that he didn't disagree with any of Obama's decisions. Um, and it's because these are difficult issues. It's partly what you say about the nation state, but it's the clarity of the challenge. In, if you have to defeat an enemy in war, and you're at war, then that's what, that is all consuming. All national objectives can be subordinate to the great objective of victory in war. You don't worry about the national debt. People have to eat less. They have to cope. But if it's not a total war or a total challenge, then governments are less sure about the sacrifices that they can expect. They still have an energy policy. They still uh, worry about their economy and debt. They still worry about employment and so on. Um, so actually a lot of the debates that we have at the moment are about 
what liabilities we are prepared to accept in military terms in order to achieve objectives that are limited. And I think that's, that's the basic dilemma. Uh, and I don't, I mean, strategy can help you about that in giving you questions to ask, but I don't think it gives you a solution. It's a political judgment at the end. Now, on the question of nations and states, we, for a long time, we talked about nation states, but as your question indicated, they're different things. And the problem that we have is um, some states have a lot of nations, including my own. Um, some nations have a number of states, the Kurds, um, for example. And a lot of the problems that we've seen uh, are the challenges to states posed by nationality. Um, and that's, I mean, you, or you can call it ethnicity or religion or whatever. But that, so I think the two concepts are still as relevant as ever. And I think at the end, the state is still critical. Uh, Max Weber talked about the state uh, as having the monopoly of organized violence. And it's the challenges to that monopoly, whether they're internal or external, that still basically provide a lot of the themes uh, for armed conflict. So I think it, it, it's not that these concepts are irrelevant now, but that they, um, but they were never as simple as was supposed. And I think the other point, which goes back to the, the, the coalition point, is that we talk about groupings like the West or Europe um, as if they have a coherence beyond, um, like equivalent to states. And of course, that is, becomes again, at the moment, quite a big issue as to whether or not they ever really can. So I think the state is still critical, even though the context is, is different. Je voulais en, je, je voulais en, en, en poser deux d'emblée, mais du coup, je vais peut-être en poser qu'une. Alors... Ma première question, en fait, je l'improvise parce qu'elle m'est venue à écouter Hervé et à t'écouter aussi. S'il y a une crise de la stratégie, est-ce qu'elle ne provient pas aussi du fait que nous avons cru, nous, occidentaux, y compris nous, Français, et tu parlais de, des lumières et de la, de la raison, nous sommes ici dans un temple de la raison, est-ce que ça ne provient pas du fait que nous avons peut-être eu tendance à oublier que la force des, des passions, la force des émotions était quelque chose de, qui restait tout à fait central dans l'explication des mécanismes de conflictualité, dans l'explication des décisions politiques, que ce soit au niveau international ou même, ou même national. Est-ce que l'ère nucléaire ne nous a pas justement trompés en, en mettant l'accent sur ces phénomènes hyper rationnels que sont la théorie des jeux, toutes choses qui, qui rendent finalement assez mal compte de, euh, du fonctionnement de l'esprit humain. Donc c'est une hypothèse que je formule de manière un petit peu improvisée, mais je voudrais t'interroger sur cette question. Est-ce que s'il y a une crise de la stratégie, est-ce que ça ne provient pas aussi de cela, de notre vision occidentale, peut-être euh, peut être insuffisante, pas erronée, mais insuffisante, de la manière dont les crises et les conflits se jouent aujourd'hui It's a really interesting question and um, I think if you go outside of the military sphere um, to a lot of rational choice theory to um, the influence of the idea that we are calculating all the time on the basis of our preferences, on the basis of our interests, and these calculations uh, guide our behavior, um, and that's the, that's the clue to dealing with the behavior of others as well. And uh, if you look 
at a lot of American military thought, especially in the 1990s, um, a lot of it was very influenced by uh, the possibilities of new technologies, by the uh, way in which um, military moves might be made by the United States, which would so disorientate opponents, they wouldn't know where to start, uh, but was geared to an opponent that was actually rather like the United States, because otherwise there wouldn't be a point or a necessity to have to work out a strategy because the Americans were going to be so strong there wasn't an issue. And when you look at the nuclear issue, actually you start to realize the problems with that. Why was it that we could ever imagine our countries issuing a nuclear or using nuclear weapons? Um, because we imagined scenarios in which we'd been attacked, the whole fate of our civilization in some way is at risk, and just as in the Second World War, this process led to us being prepared to countenance terrible air raids against Germany, against Japan, actually against France, uh, in the, uh, around the time of D-Day, um, and culminated in nuclear weapons. So we assume that highly emotional process would work again. Otherwise, why did we believe that we could ever bring ourselves to do such a thing, especially when in all likelihood it would be done to us in return? And what I often wonder is what is the consequence in this respect of um, the period since 1945, <clears throat> and especially the period since 1990, when we have got used to the idea, for good reasons, that if we do use armed force, we should avoid civilians as much as possible, that we should um, keep our own casualties down as little as possible, to as few as possible, and that one of the reasons we might go to war is to prevent humanitarian distress. So how do we, how do we couple that with an apparent readiness to hold a nuclear arsenal and use it? Now, you and I know how to rationalize it and why um, you can make a case for nuclear weapons not as instruments of war, but as perpetual demonstrators of the foolishness of war, uh, and hope that it continues to work in that role. But if the crisis develops, that issue would come about. And to a lesser extent, much lesser extent, it's a reason why, um, in some ways, the Americans and the rest of us were so unprepared for 9-11 and what happened in Iraq and Afghanistan, because we had turned strategy into something very cerebral, intellectual, calculating, without taking account of personality and character and causes and things that matter to people. Um, we can't do that anymore, we understand that, but it, it, you can't, manufacture that emotion on our side if the stakes that seem to be involved uh, don't seem to be so threatening and demanding as before. I think this goes back to, to, to the previous answer. So I think this question is indeed still central to um, considerations of warfare. It's why we've tried to find forms of, uh, of force ways of using armed force that are limited, contained, um, not too vicious. Um, and sometimes, on our side, we may think we've succeeded, but if you look at what's going on in Syria, in Iraq, in Lebanon, uh, CAR, uh, you can see what happens 
when the passions and the emotions are still very strong. Donc à mon tour, je vais, je vais prolonger euh, une, la question qui a été posée par, euh, par Bruno euh, en posant euh, le problème de la rationalité donc, qui est à l'œuvre dans, euh, dans la stratégie. Pendant longtemps, dans la pensée stratégique, le modèle de la rationalité, c'était l'histoire. Les stratèges sont, ont été pendant très longtemps des historiens Jomini, par exemple, écrit d'abord l'histoire des guerres de la Révolution et de l'Empire, et ensuite, il en tire les principes de la stratégie, Delbruck, Lidlart, etc. On pourrait faire une très longue liste. Aujourd'hui, la pensée stratégique se nourrit d'autres modèles de rationalité qu'elle va puiser, dans votre livre, par exemple, qui en est une très bonne illustration, dans l'éthologie, dans les sciences cognitives, dans l'économie, et outre le fait d'apporter d'autres formes de rationalité, ces euh, modèles-là apportent aussi différentes conceptions du sujet qui est à l'œuvre dans la stratégie. Par exemple, jusqu'à quel point peut-on euh, considérer qu'il s'agit du même sujet qui est à l'œuvre, par exemple dans le fameux dilemme du prisonnier, qui est un, une une figure stratégique essentielle, et dans l'action des États et dans les relations entre les États. Il ne s'agit évidemment pas du même sujet, et pourtant, on transpose depuis le dilemme du prisonnier vers les relations internationales le même modèle. La question donc que je pose est, que se passe-t-il dans cette opération de transposition Est-ce qu'il y a simplement un transfert analogique, on applique à une autre échelle un modèle qu'on tire d'une relation interindividuelle, ou y a-t-il une opération de transformation des principes mêmes de la stratégie dès lors qu'on change de sujet Interesting. Let me... Um, there's two points to make. The first is there has been a shift. Um, the people who wrote about strategy were either practitioners or the historians. Um, after the Second World War, even during the Second World War, engineers, scientists, economists found that they had a role to play, and they did. And when it came to nuclear warfare, in a sense, the only people who could comprehend what it was all about seemed to be the game theorists, because by talking of it in abstracted terms, through metaphors, um, it was possible to cope with the enormity of the discussion. Uh, whereas if you'd had to talk about it solely in terms of mass murder, you'd have ground to a halt very quickly. But the best of those um, who, who worked in that vein, the economist Tom Schelling, I would say, is the best, uh, was always aware of the history and never believed he was providing a mathematical solution to our problems. He was explicit that mathematics didn't solve the problem. What I think has happened in a lot of, uh, unfortunately, a lot of political science, um, Uh, certainly that which is influenced more by economics and rational choice theory is the belief that you can model all of this and then when you try to apply it to the real word, world it doesn't quite fit but that's interesting uh, that, that, that then suggests things you can explore and ask questions about in practice it seems to me strategy is inherently interdisciplinary um, if you look at the writings of a general or the commentaries of great generals or great political leaders, they may talk in historical terms, especially about themselves, uh, but they will be talk, what will have influenced them? The, they'll have to understand engineering, they'll have to understand the properties 
of the weapons with which they're dealing. They need to understand terrain and climate. Um, they will all consider themselves reasonable psychologists because they will have tried to get into the mind of their opponent and worked out how they, how they were thinking. Um, logistics is very much a, a field of economics. Um, so it, it just seems to me that strategy is inherently interdisciplinary. Um, and there's no reason if, that, that if you're interested in it that you shouldn't, as I try to do, look at what sociologists and uh, cognitive psychologists, um, uh, classic, classical scholars have written about. They've all got something to say. One of you know, the problems of the academic world is we spend too long in our disciplinary boundaries, and that's one of the differences between worlds of theory and worlds of practice. Uh, also, in the world of practice, you can't uh, put, put a hypothesis uh, and then ha have a number of experiments or ask to do more research. Um, the decision has to be taken and you've got to use judgment. And a lot of what we're talking about in strategy is often not very deliberate, well thought out um, proposals, but judgments, quite quick judgments uh, that have to be made because a decision is needed and that decision can be fateful. So um, I think it's a very interesting area, but my, my answer is that any discipline, whether it's history or economics, if that's the only one you're using, it'll limit you, and that we should be interdisciplinary. Si je devais prolonger la discussion sur ce point, ce que je ne ferais pas, j'aurais envie de dire que c'est plus plutôt que la théorie des jeux, c'est plutôt la, ce qu'on appelle parfois la théorie des perspectives, prospect theory, qui serait un cadre de référence plus intéressant. Mais ma, ma question portera sur le, le cyberespace, domaine dont tu n'as pas parlé. Si on devait... Il euh, y, y a plusieurs manières de voir cette nouvelle dimension de la stratégie. La première c'est de voir le cyberespace comme un, comme un cinquième espace de, la, de bataille, après la terre, la mer, euh, l'air, l'espace, et de dire que finalement, euh, c'est un domaine qui attend euh, euh, son, son mahan ou, ou son douet, et qui nous dira peut-être que la bataille décisive se jouera dans le cyberespace. Il y a une autre manière de dire, qui, à dire que c'est un peu comme le nucléaire pendant la guerre froide, on attend un Tom Schelling qui nous dira que c'est très différent. Ça demande un cadre de référence différent. Et il y a peut-être une troisième manière encore de voir les choses qui, est, qui consiste à dire que on est dans un domaine qui est tellement abstrait, qui est tellement technique et tellement classifié, que de toute façon on ne pourra pas raisonner dans le cyberespace comme on a raisonné en termes stratégiques dans les trois autres, les quatre autres domaines. C'est um, une interesting question. Um, because this is the vogue area now. Uh, everybody's getting into cyber of some sort. Um, it's basically the idea uh, uh, of, of, of cyborgs and so on is the integration of men and machines. And well, that's where the idea comes from. Um, what it really seems to mean now is that our dependence on um, digitized information is so great um, that we might be caught out one day uh, in some devilish attack. And it's interesting because, as you indicate, um, we seem incapable of thinking about a new factor in conflict, which this undoubtedly is, without trying to work out how it can lead to a decisive battle. Uh, but it's not going to lead to a decisive battle for all sorts of reasons. It's, very, it's actually very difficult to mount an offensive, cyber offensive. Uh, it takes a lot of time, and it's a very risky thing to do because you've got to uh, be able to simulate the target because if you don't understand their defenses, the whole thing can be lost. So what you have is another dimension of conflict. It's very important. There's now attempts to shut down people's systems uh, at times of conflict. 
as a way, as an alternative to conflict. The Russians have used this against Estonia. Um, there's concern about uh, data and, and who can gain access to it. Uh, and what do they do with it all? How do you interrogate these? If, you, if you've taken two million telephone calls, what actually do you do with them? Uh, because nobody's going to listen to them all. So how do, you in, how do you find out what you need from all of that? So there's a lot of interesting issues. It's an important area. And I think, that, to me, the, the key thing is the move from information as a scarce resource, which is how it has been until recently. Uh, it was no different from other resources. Um, your plans, written on a bit of paper, if somebody else could get them, uh, could be a devastating blow. Uh, but information is no longer scarce. Information is plentiful. Uh, it can be easily reproduced and multiplied um, and can be interfered with. But if it's interfered with, then there are alternative sources of information. So I think it's a fascinating area to look at. It's important. It's another dimension to conflict for us to think about, it's very hard to get the measure of. But if people try to think of it in terms of um, another way of winning a war, they're going to be disappointed um, or maybe relieved. Um, most <coughs> cyber activity of relevance is to do with crime or, or espionage. Very limited amounts are about shutting down important systems. Um, um, no, they're not trivial, but it's not war winning. La démocratie est moins forte que la stratégie des estomacs. Et c'est une question qui va peut-être nous amener dans l'actualité. À la fin du mois, il y a un sommet franco-britannique sur les, sur les questions de défense. Et pas pour rester sur cette actualité diplomatique, mais pour faire un peu un pas d'écart, on a quand même l'impression que les Européens sont confrontés à de multiples défis stratégiques. Il y a une difficulté à les hiérarchiser. Est-ce que vous pouvez nous aider à le faire mais que surtout l'Europe continue à se comporter comme un acteur stratégique malgré lui. Et est-ce que vous voyez comment, et cette question s'adresse à un citoyen britannique, est-ce que vous voyez possible qu'enfin, un jour, peut-être, l'Europe, et à ce moment-là, comment, s'assume vraiment comme un acteur stratégique de plein exercice You'd be disappointed and surprised if I answered that positively. Um, the British view, which I share, I'm not speaking for the British government uh, at all, um, the view I've held for a long time is that um, historically and practically, Britain not only should be part of Europe, but work very closely with other European countries. And the European country it should work most closely with is France. I'm not saying that because I'm here. I've written it, and I th that's what I think. Um, and, uh, and that's a question of capacity. Uh, there are interesting questions about the German role. Um, a lot of the smaller European countries um, are, can play quite uh, significant roles. Britain uh, and Denmark work very extraordinarily closely together now um, in, in a number of operations. Um, but it'll be done like that. And the reason um, that... Uh, I can imagine circumstances in which Europeans end up working together. They would be very drastic. I'd rather not imagine them, but one can think of circumstances where Europe as a whole will be galvanized into action, perhaps because of um, some action involving Russia. Hard to imagine it involving anybody else. And I don't particularly imagine that. But for most of the time, the individual conflicts that we face will get solidarity from Europeans, 
but they will be reluctant to contribute. And this has been going on for a long time. It, it was true, it's been true with NATO, and it's been true with the EU. It was brought home to me a long time ago, talking to a British official uh, who'd just come back from a, a European Council meeting, in which the, 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 the whole group have been discussing action that should be taken with regard to a particular African country. And at some point during this meeting, it became apparent that the only country who would be able to take this action was Britain. So everybody was discussing what Britain should do. Um, in the full knowledge, they wouldn't have to do it themselves. And that's not a tenable basis for um, the sort of decisions we're talking about. So I think in practice, a lot of discussions are going to be bilateral and multilateral and so on, rather than Europe acting as a strategic actor. And the difficulty has been that these dis instead of having a discussion about the problem at hand, we get into a discussion about the European project and what we need to do to complete it. Uh, and we're so far away from that on so many other measures that um, it actually just detracts from the problems at hand. That being said, we have severe problems at hand. France is now involved in a whole range of African countries. Um, the position in Europe is, in the Middle East is deteriorating rapidly. And we may find ourselves not just worrying what we do about Syria or even Lebanon or even Iraq, but say Jordan. Um, and we do so at a time when the Americans say they haven't gone away, but by necessity, their focus is on Asia-Pacific, where, frankly, I think the, the risks of major war are much greater. So in these circumstances, Europeans need to talk a lot to each other and think very hard about priorities uh, and, and how we get the maximum out of our capabilities. Um, so I, I, you know, as a European, uh, I feel this is really important because we have a responsibility for our own neighborhood. Um, and that responsibility is, is growing. And the tendencies in defense are the other direction, including in my own country, to do less, um, to be more risk averse. And we all know why. Um, but you know, if one wants to um, think strategically about these issues, it's not working out some grand strategic plan for Europe. It's identifying the pressure points, asking questions about the means at our disposal, thinking about the sort of things we could do in advance, um, thinking a bit more about the other instruments of power in addition to the military. That's the sort of thing we, could, we might be doing. Um, because I think, you know, we, we, although the great dangers of the sort that we'll be marking, thinking about the First World War or even the Napoleonic Wars uh, in the next couple of years, but those dangers are not anything like the same as before. And for that, we should be grateful. But these other dangers are very present. Um, and I think Europeans do need to do more, but they need to do it in a series of conversations rather than trying to come up with yet another strategic concept to which everybody signs up to, which is negotiated into meaninglessness because nobody dares to commit on a bit of paper to something they're not sure they can deliver politically. Merci beaucoup. Je voulais rappeler euh, aux auditeurs que notre programme comporte donc une douzaine de conférences. La prochaine euh, sera donnée par Pierre Asner, qui vous salue d'ailleurs. On aura le plaisir d'entendre euh, Laurence Friedman le 7 avril, une, douzième, une deuxième fois à la suite en fin de cycle, avec un colloque euh, conclusif réunissant l'ensemble des participants le 10 avril. Je voudrais vraiment vous remercier euh, infiniment euh, d'être venu ce soir et euh, euh, vous, vous dire combien euh, vous êtes euh, bienvenu euh, dans cette université, combien elle vous est reconnaissante de cette intervention. Merci.